the way. I am the truth and I am the life. His truth is marching on this morning. In spite of who attacks it, in spite of who fights against it, his truth is marching on. His truth is going to stand forever.
but I want, I want the congregation to get involved in this song. First, we're going to have all the, all the men in the church going to get the baritone sound, the low bass end sound. We're going to say glory, glory, hallelujah. It goes like this. To say glory, glory, hallelujah. Help me out, man. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Help me out with that glow in.
checks on money that you have to put in there. They call that insufficient funds. And folks come to the house of God week in and week out and say, I didn't get anything out of church. The answer is, we don't get anything out is because we don't put anything in. But the Bible said that when Jacob laid down and slept, he used stones for pillars. And he saw angels ascending and descending. Before the angels came down, he had to send up prayers and blessings to God. Before the blessings of God come down, the praises have got to go up. Before the anointing flows down from the dead, before it comes from the throne of heaven, there's got to be some prayer and thanksgiving that goes up. That's why we're worshiping in this house today, because worship is thanksgiving, and it's gratitude to say it. Thank you, Jesus. You didn't have to put clothes on my back today. You didn't have to put food on my table this week. You didn't have to wake me up in my right mind. But I come to say thank you, Jesus. I come to say thank you, Jesus. I said, can't you see him working on the outside?
Some of us need the victory. Say, Pastor, how do you know I need the victory? Because I've been looking at some of y'all and you had not smiled since you've been in this house yet today. Look like the devil's got your joy, your song, your victory, and your shout. But this victory march is for you today. The second reason is because we have the victory. So whether you need it or whether you got it, the victory march is for you today. It goes like this. Nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ can wash my sins away. And wash away my sins. Nothing but the blood.
sins be so big that his blood can't cover them. Amen. Never will, be your, will, will your life be so far gone that the blood of Jesus can't reach you. I thank God for the blood of Jesus today. Hallelujah. Wonderful name of Jesus. I bless your name, Lord. I lift your name on high, Jesus. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. You were the word of
None like you, Jesus. You are without fear. You're incomparable. You have no rivals. None can stand against you, Lord. You are mighty, wonderful, righteous, and holy God. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. Why don't you lift your hands across the sanctuary this morning? Blessed be the mighty name of Jesus. Blessed be the mighty name of Jesus. How great thou art, O Lord. How wonderful. How wonderful you are, Lord. I wonder how many of you need a miracle in this house today.
house today? Isn't he moving in this sanctuary? Isn't the Lord moving in this house? Hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. Lord, bless us. We're making our way back to our places this morning. Amen. Blessed be the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. How many of you really feel the presence of the Lord here today? Blessed be the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I feel the Holy Ghost today. How about you? Blessed be the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. I want to take time this morning and welcome so many guests with us into the house of the Lord. People here from across our great nation on this Sunday morning with us in the house of God. It's an honor to have you with us in church. Sister Terry, Sister Sherry, and Sister Brenda, these three sisters have come all the way from Dallas, Texas. Stand up and show us who you are today. God bless them today for being in the house of the Lord. Thank you. Amen. Amen. She called here a while back, and then I answered the phone, and she liked to have a Holy Ghost fit when I answered the phone. <laughs> People think that pastors aren't supposed to answer phones, but if you, if you had this phone, you would say don't answer it anymore, trust me. Amen. But, but I'm thankful to talk to people across the nation and people across the world on a day in and day out basis that are blessed by joining in with our services and feeling the Holy Ghost with us. Other guests with us here today, we don't know you. Amen. Folks here from Oklahoma, City, Oklahoma, and different other places, we don't know you, but let's give them all a hand clap this morning. Bless them. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The Bible said, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on Him should not perish but have everlasting life. I know that He loves me. There's no question that God loves me and that He's been good to me. But I want to say this morning, Jesus, that I love You with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength.
happening, be sure that you get a calendar in the foyer of the church today. And on that calendar is 12 months of events that are going on in the church. And in these, uh, on this calendar, you'll find lots of youth rallies and events and things going on throughout the week. Um, to begin with, this Tuesday morning at 9 a.m., we have we have a meeting prior to our temporary restraining order, permanent slash temporary injunction that has been placed upon us and which has restrained us from going on the property that we purchased one year ago this week. And the devil's fought as hard as he could for the past two years and finally found the loophole to get us to comply for a few days. And we had no choice but to. Had we not have been, I would be preaching to you from this pulpit this morning. And I'd be somewhere in the East Baton Rouge Parish Prison. And as hard as that is for you to imagine, these are the days in which we're living. Amen. So be in prayer at 9 a.m. Tuesday morning that things go favorably for us. <clears throat> and we don't want to go to a court date on Wednesday. It's a miracle that we're getting a meeting Tuesday prior to going before the 19th Judicial Court. And we know that if we go to the court appearance on Wednesday, that it would take a trial to get us to be able to use our property again. And we don't want to do that. So it's a miracle in and of itself that Tuesday morning is happening. And receive word of that late Friday evening that that's going to happen. So God's working already. And God will wait until the last window of opportunity to step in show out and show off and let you know that he's in charge of everything anyhow. So March the 22nd is just 16 days away. And that is when we go to the Louisiana Supreme Court in New Orleans and seven Supreme Court justices are going to hear oral argument on a motion to quash why the state should drop the charges that have caused us to be in criminal court and criminal proceedings for the past 24 months. So the crime that we are being charged with is holding church during a pandemic, failure to comply with governor's emergency orders. You'll notice these are not laws. These are orders and these are mandates. And for that, we are, uh, we are going to the Louisiana Supreme Court. That's two cases that are going. The third one is now before the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals again. June the 7th, 2021, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals ruled in our favor. They said that our establishment clause rights were violated, free exercise, free speech, and assembly clauses were violated. Of course, they sent it back down to the lower courts. The lower courts sat on that case for seven months and seven days and said, yes, we were wrong to have arrested you. Yes, we were wrong to tell you couldn't go to church, but we claim qualified immunity, so you can't do anything about it. Threw that out, and now we have to go back through the process again. Back to the Fifth Circuit, Louisiana Supreme Court, United States Supreme Court, sometime down the road. This has been going on for 24 months now. And that's three cases, and there's others that are significant yet insignificant. When you came on this property today, you were surveilled by cameras illegally placed on the servitude, surveilling everyone that comes in and leaves this property. And that in and of itself is illegal activity by our federal government. One of those cameras came down about a week or so ago that was on our bedroom window, surveilling us, not only watching, but hearing everything that we've done for the past two years. And there are still other cameras up today. And don't forget that this is happening in America. It's, it's happening, it's not going to, but it's happening right now. The new world order we are already a part of. The Antichrist system is already in full throttle and he's wanted to do all that he can, but the church won't allow him to do it. Amen. 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 So in spite of all that, uh, we still have to get permission from a judge, governor's attorney, district attorney, and our attorneys to be able to travel. And they give you a letter and says that 
something happens, this person has permission to travel out of the city of Baton Rouge. And don't worry, they're coming for you next. Amen. If they did it to the preacher, they're coming for you next. It's not if, it's when. So you, you need to lean on Jesus Christ more than you ever have. And if I can do it for two years, you can do it too. Can I have an amen? amen. And if you can hold strong and stand, you can make it. You gotta make it. You gotta make it. Praise the Lord. And we're thankful that in spite of all that, God has blessed us supernaturally. God has, God has provided for us in spite of all that. Amen. You can. We sincerely want to thank you for joining us in today's service here at Life Tabernacle in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. It means so much to us that you have taken time to worship God with us today in our online service. As you can see, there are many people marching and giving by way of tithing and offering at this time while you are viewing this video. We encourage you to get involved in the tithe and the offering. The Bible says to give and it shall be given unto you good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. And when you give into the church, into our ministry, I assure you that you are sowing your seed into good ground and it is gonna produce a great crop for many people, including yourself. So God richly bless you in Jesus' name. We'll see you back in the service in a few moments. Turning with us in your Bible to the book of Philippians, chapter number four. 
the book of Philippians chapter 4. This is in the New Testament of your Bible. To our old Scofield readers, it's going to be page 1260. After the books of 1st and 2nd Corinthians, you'll find Galatians, Ephesians, then Philippians, just prior to the book of Colossians. Philippians 4 and verse number 19. 419. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. You have a need, I have a God. You have a need, I have a God. God bless us. We're seated in the fear of the Lord today. The Lord, my pasture, shall prepare and feed me with a shepherd's care. His presence shall my want supply and guard me with his watchful eye. My noonday walks he shall attend and all my midnight hours defend. When on the sultry Levi fain or on the thirsty mountain through fertile vales and dewy meads, my weary wandering path he leads. Where peaceful rivers soft and slow amid the verdant landscape flow. When through the paths of death I tread, where stormy horrors overspread, my steadfast heart shall fear no ill, for thou, O Lord, art with me still. Thy patient hand shall give me aid and guide me through the dreadful shade. Though in a bare and rugged way through devious, lonely wilds I stray, thy bounty shall my pains beguile. The lonely wilderness shall smile. Everyone in this sanctuary today have one thing in common. We are all needy people. Each of us have needs. If you don't, better not admit it. Better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to have opened your mouth and remove all doubt. We are needy people. You say, well, I have no needs today. That's what Laodicea said. They were rich. They were increased with goods. They said they were clothed. They said that they could see, but they were really blind. They were really naked. They were really wretched. They were the most needy of all the churches. And God had scorching rebuke for them because they had need of nothing. But the very fact that you're in this sanctuary today is evidence that you have need. There are needs, people, some with greater than others. There is a modern day book of Esther that is transpiring before the eyes of 7.2 billion people this morning with Russia having invaded Ukraine. President Zelensky, the president of the Ukraine, is a Jewish man that refused to give in to the tyranny, the evil bear of Russia that is committing a genocide upon hundreds of thousands of people at this very moment. Innocent men, women, and children that are being slaughtered and blown to pieces. And whatever you think about it, the world is in trouble today. The world needs Jesus Christ. Not only in Ukraine, but the precipice of war with China against Taiwan. The precipice of war in Canada, right here in the United States of America. And the unknown skyrocketing inflation prices. Last Sunday, when I preached, I said that we'd be at $5 a gallon gasoline by the summer. I scared myself when I said it only to realize that it may be before the week was up. 
we'd be at five dollars a gallon and the fact of the matter is you'll see seven and eight dollars per gallon before the summertime gets here it, it it is a time of perplexity in our nation and in our world and the spirit of the antichrist is growing more and more by the minute he is he is trying to choke out the life of good people today. And we all have needs. Some people are going to fail for fear, not knowing what tomorrow will bring. There's no need in you to panic. No need in you to panic by and fail for fear because God's got everything in control. If you have a need, I have a God. Genesis 22 and 13, God told Abraham to take his only son to the top of Moriah. There offer him as a sacrifice unto God. When Abraham had put him up on the altar, the, the Isaac, that 33-year-old boy, looked at his father and said, Here is the stone, here is the wood, but where is the sacrifice? And Abraham looked at his son Isaac and said, Son, the Lord our God shall provide himself a sacrifice. I have a need for a sacrifice. And God told Abraham that that's all right. I'm going to supply your need. And when Abraham would raise the knife to the heaven and thrust it through the flesh of his boy, the Lord stopped him and the ram was caught by its horn in the thicket. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, for the Lord shall provide for me. Abraham had a need, and God supplied his needs according to his riches in glory. And whenever Pharaoh said that I'm going to kill all the baby boys in Egypt, every, every baby that's born that is a boy, we're going to slaughter him. You know, it has always been a plan of the devil to kill the boys, destroy the men. He did it in Pharaoh's day. He did it in Herod's day. Every baby boy two years and younger was murdered by Herod. And there is in the United States of America. You don't have to look to Exodus to find Pharaoh killing the boys and, and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to see Herod killing the boys. You don't have to look any further than right here in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, that the devil is trying to kill our young men. He wants to exterminate them. He wants to wipe them out because they're made in God's image and after God's likeness. You can't go before the day is up without seeing some teenage boy that's been gunned down senselessly right here in our own city. You won't get through the week without seeing there'll be a half a dozen murders of young men right here in our city. That is not even counting the 40 per day that are slaughtered in the abortion clinics right here in our own city. But Pharaoh said we're going to kill every baby boy. And Moses had parents that were not afraid of the king's commandments. They hid their boy for 90 days. When they could hide him no longer, they put him in an ark of bulrushes and put him in the river Nile with those crocodiles swimming and the rough waves of the Nile River. They had no idea that God would put that baby boy in the bathhouse and the swimming pool of Pharaoh's daughter. And you know what? Moses' parents had a need, but they had a God. And they, they put him there in the hands of God, but God supplied their needs. And for 40 years, he was raised in Pharaoh's daughter's household, educated, taught the ways of war, and God supplied the needs of Moses' parents. In Exodus 3 and 9, you fast forward 80 years, Israel had a need for a deliverer. They could not deliver themselves. They could not break out of slavery all alone. So they cried out and God said, I have heard the cry of my son Israel by reason of their taskmasters. And God sent Moses down at 80 years of age to go into the land of Egypt. 
Egypt and tell Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, let my people go. You see, when you give God what you have, your children, then God will use them to deliver another generation some 80 years later. Amen. It's not about you. It's not about me. you got to learn how to trust in the Lord and put everything in the hands of the Lord and later on God will take care of you. Amen. They were, they were oppressed. They were enslaved. But God delivered them. In Exodus 13 and 22, whenever the children of Israel had come to the Red Sea shore and the Red Sea was before them and Pharaoh's army was behind them with a mountain on either side of them, there was nowhere to go. There was nowhere to hide. They couldn't go forward and they were drowned. They could not go backward and they would be slaughtered by Pharaoh's 60,000 chariots. But do you know they had a need? So God put a pillar of fire between Pharaoh's army and the children of Israel. And until two and a half million of the Jews were clean across the Red Sea, God lifted up that pillar of fire and the Egyptians are saying to do so were drowned. It doesn't matter if it's a deliverer that is needed. It doesn't matter if it is a ram that is needed. It doesn't matter if it is a Red Sea that needs to be parted. If you have a need, I have a God. Not only did God use that pillar of fire to destroy his enemies in Egypt, but God used that fire at night to keep them warm in the freezing temperatures of Sinai. Amen. Isn't it something that the same fire that God uses to destroy your enemies is the same fire that God can use to protect and preserve you? Isn't it something, amen, that what the world can't go through, God will bring you through to give you a testimony? Isn't it something while the rest of the world is shutting down and, and coming a part of the seams and cold churches are closing and businesses are closing and people are at wit's end as to what to do. God is using the same pandemic and the same disaster to promote his gospel and to perform miracles and to bring the lost that can be found and to open the blinded eyes. Amen. That's why you have to trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own use the same weapon that he uses to destroy your enemy to use it as a, as a healing for you. Amen. Amen. Exodus 16 and 12. Whenever, whenever the Jews were out in the Sinai Desert, the nation of Israel, they were hungry and God rained down manna out of heaven and quelled every evening. Imagine six days a week. Angel food being fresh baked in the ovens of heaven and God pouring it down out of heaven and it raining down in the morning and when the children of Israel would go out and gather it the Bible said that they had sustenance and they had enough to preserve them for 40 years and God provided for them. They had a need but they had a God. Amen. In Exodus 17 and 6 whenever they were thirsty God said all you got to do is take the rod in your hand and smite the rock and when you smite the rock there's going to come forth waters out that are going to rush, that are going to quench your thirst and save your life where you otherwise would have starved and, and, and died of thirst in this wilderness. Amen. They needed food. God was their bread from heaven. They needed water. God was that well that sprang up out of the rock. Amen. They had a need, but they have a God. In the book of 1 Kings 17 and 9, whenever, whenever Elijah decried a famine on the land of Israel, he said it's not going to rain for three and a half years. There's going to be famine in the land. There's going to be starvation. Cattle are going to die and the rivers, brooks, streams are all going to dry up. But I'm going to send you to Zarephath. And there I have commanded a widow to sustain thee there. Notice 
Moses uh, that whenever God spoke to Elijah, he had already spoken to the widow woman at Zarephath, uh, and she's expecting him uh, to come uh, and supply her needs. Uh, and he's expecting, uh, amen, God to supply his needs. Uh, when you get in touch with the Holy Ghost, uh, amen, you'll have needs out there in your life and in your house and in your family. Uh, but God's already speaking to his minister in the pulpit uh, to feed my people this message uh, and to tell them this is what saith the word of the Lord. Uh, you know why? Because you have a need, uh, but we both have a God. Uh, and God can speak to the both of us uh, and let us know, uh, amen, exactly what it is that we need. Uh, amen. In Exodus 14 and 15, uh, whenever, whenever Moses had come to the Red Sea, he said, what are you doing standing there, Moses? Speak to the children that they go forward. What are you doing standing here? I didn't bring you here to let you die. I want you to go forward. Some of you are afraid of the future. Some of you don't know what tomorrow holds. And you locked yourself up. And you said, I'm just going to cocoon. And I'm going to wither away in fear and intimidation. And let will be what will be. But that is not the mindset of a true child of God. I want you to know that what the devil means for bad, God means for good. And if you can just hold on to God's unchanging hand and keep going even when there's a sea before you and an army behind you and a mountain on either side of you, you can't quit. When the going gets tough, the tough get going. You can't throw in the towel. you got to make up your mind that you're going to keep on working for Jesus. That you're going to keep on walking with him every step of the way. No matter what happens. No matter who quits. No matter who talks about you. No matter who fights with you. you got to make up in your mind that you're just going to keep going. It doesn't matter what your needs are. If you have a need, I have a God. Amen. Israel thought they were trapped. But God supplied their needs by getting revenge on Egypt. Do you know what the Bible said? That Daniel 6 and 24, God was tired of those accusers of Daniel. God was tired of the bullies getting the upper hand. God was tired of the wicked oppressors that were, that were condemning Daniel day in and day out. So they put forth a decree that no man could pray to any other God for 30 days. Darius. Daniel did not quit praying. He did as he did aforetime. You gotta make up in your mind. It don't matter what tyrant, what dictator, what mayor, or what governor says you can't pray and worship and go to church. You gotta make up in your mind. The word of God was here long before you. God supplied my needs long before you. God has made a way for me long before you. did not quit praying but they threw him in the den of lions and when they put him in that den of lions amen the king couldn't sleep all night and he come up the next morning are you alright Daniel and Daniel said the Lord that I continually serve day and night has sent his angels and shut up the lions of the lions real tight and you know what that king brought the enemies of Daniel that king brought the accusers of Daniel that king brought those that sought accusation against Daniel and he put him in the den of lions but they didn't come out the same way the, the lions destroyed them and tore their flesh from off of their bones I want you to know there's a reason that God's got some of you in trouble this morning is if you just trust in the Lord in your trouble God's got revenge on some of your enemies and he's going to use you to take them down He's going to use you to destroy them. He's going to use you to get revenge. Amen. All you got to do is keep your head right. Just keep your heart right. Just keep on trusting in the Lord. And watch God make a way for you, Daniel. Daniel had a need, but Daniel had a God. Amen. Never compromise your faith to appease your enemies. I said just because they tell you don't pray doesn't mean you have to obey. Just because they tell you. I know people write a 
tell you there's a different separation between church and state and you can't pray on your job and you can't witness about Jesus on your job and you can't invite people to church on your job but the same people that tell you you can't are talking about pornography and four letter words and doing everything they're big enough to do Amen. I've had it when I was evangelizing and knocking doors and some landlord wants to tell me that I can't go in there and knock on doors and invite people to church. It's quite simple. I tell them, if you first shut down the crack cocaine dealer and the meth dealer from coming in here and peddling their dope to these people, then I'll quit coming in here and talking about Jesus. If you don't have any power over the devil, don't try to come in and exercise power on Jesus. Don't you let anybody tell you where you can or cannot preach. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and they that dwell therein. You know what? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego told the king, we are not careful to answer you in this matter. We're going to serve God whether we go to the fiery furnace or not. Seems to me like everybody's as bold as they want to be today. Everybody's as loud as they want to be today except for the church. But thank God there is a church on the corner of Hooper and Blackwater that said we are not careful. We are not careful. We're going to keep on working for Jesus. We're going to keep on evangelizing. We're going to keep on talking about miracles. We're going to keep on shouting the victory. No matter what comes our way. Amen. For there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful that he will not suffer you to be tempted. Above that you are able, but will with the temptation make a way of escape that you might be able to bear it. Do you know there's an escape route in your troublesome situation right now? You can't see it because God knows everything. God's got the keys to the door that you can't even see. God has the provision that you don't even know he's working on right now. That's why you have to stay faithful to God. That's why you can't give up. That's why you can't give in. If you have a need, I have a God. If you have a cancer, I have a healer. If you have heart disease, I have a healer. If you have indebtedness, I have a healer. If you have brokenness, I have a healer. If you have a need, I have a God. Hallelujah. Just hold on. God's going to supply your needs. In the book of Psalm, the 42nd chapter, amen, in the 10th and the 11th verse, look what the songwriter said here. He said this. He said, as with a sword in my bones, my enemies reproach me while they say daily unto me, where is thy God? Has anybody beside this preacher ever had your enemies to look at you when you're in trouble and say, you see, there you go to church and you profess Christianity and you do the best you can? Where is your God? Where is your God now? You've been, you've been giving to the Lord. You've been working for the Lord. Look at all the nightlife that you gave up. Look at all the sin that you missed out on. Look at the good times you missed out on. And you've been wasting your time living for God. Yes, sin does have some pleasure, doesn't it? But the pleasures of sin are but for a season. They don't last forever. But the joy of the Lord is eternal. It is your strength. That's why you can't pay no attention to the devil. And when the devil tries to tell you that God doesn't care about you and that God isn't real, you need to get your confirmation that I'm just going to keep on digging in for Jesus. I'm going to keep on living for the Lord. My enemies look at me and say, where is your God? If God was really real, you wouldn't be in the mess that you're in. If God was really real, you wouldn't be in the mess and the shape that you're in. How do you know that God is real? Because the devil is a liar. He came talking to me. And he said, take it easy. He said, you don't need to get all worked up. The devil told me what you were so excited about. He said, he didn't tell me there was no heaven or hell. He knew better because he had been to both. He had been to heaven and he had been to hell. It didn't take me long to figure it out that this ex-angel of light was now an angel of darkness. He was the God of this world. He relinquished his power 
to mankind whenever God created Adam. And Adam was in God's image and after his likeness. He was omnipotent like God. He was omniscient like God. He could do everything that was right the way God wanted him to. But when Adam sinned, he relinquished his power back to the devil. And ever since then, the devil has been the God of this world. He takes over men like Xi Jinping in China. He takes over economies. He takes over governor's mansions. The prince of the power of the air. Don't tell me that the devil doesn't have power. The devil does have power because in times past we walked according to the course of this world. According to the course of the prince of the power of the air. I didn't say he didn't have power, but I did say we have more power. Just a handful of people that are on the right 
side of the courtroom and on the left hand side of the courtroom were George Soros funded attorneys. They had paralegals. They had the news media. This entire side of the courtroom was filled up with hundreds of people. They were all on their laptops and they were all communicating and they were filing lawsuits and injunctions and restraining orders left and right while the judge was over there trying to plead his case. Amen. And Chief Justice Roy Moore, they had prayed before they went into the courtroom and they knew there was no way that they could win against Washington, D.C. and the state of Alabama. But he said something supernatural came into that courthouse and all of a sudden the judge came forth and ruled on the verdict and he said we could not believe our ears. All we can say is that this is a David and Goliath miracle. Goliath fell and David was on top. It doesn't matter how little you think you are. It doesn't matter how small or insignificant you think you are. It doesn't matter how big your enemies are. If you have a need, I have a God. If you have a need, I have a God. and got a phone call and said from her husband and said I, I, I just called the ambulance I'm dying he was having a massive heart attack she turned around and, and got behind the ambulance on the way to the hospital on the way to the hospital the, 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 he flatlined in the back of the ambulance they pulled over on the side of the road she being an RN knew what that meant my husband is dead they shot him back to life and cut him to the lane memorial while he was in the lane they pumped him so full of blood thinner and did an open heart surgery on him. And they said, we're going to close him up or he's going to bleed to death. They had finally gotten him stable and the electricity went out in that hospital and the generator didn't come on and he was going to die. They had the air med him to downtown the Baton Rouge General on Blue Bonnet Boulevard down here in Baton Rouge. While he was in there, we left here on a Tuesday night and the doctor came to myself and his wife and said that we have to do a surgery but there's a 1% chance of survival if we cut him open. He's not going to survive but if we don't cut him open it's a 100% chance he's going to die. You know what? I looked at his wife and that doctor and I said the Lord just spoke and said everything's going to be alright. I went out to eat with a preacher. We went out and ate a dozen raw oysters. We come back that evening and the doctor had almost lost his mind. He said, I can't understand what happened. I knew this man was dead and was going to die, but something happened. He's going to be all right. I just want you to know you have a need, but I have a God. It doesn't matter how bad your heart is. It doesn't matter how big the cancer is. It doesn't matter how bad the situation is. You have a need. I have a God. If you would check in the mailbox to take care of your rent this month, you think God can't put your children back together again? You think God can't get that person back on the right track? You have a need, I have a God. Hallelujah. Twelve long years is a long time. Twelve long years I've had an issue. Twelve long years I couldn't go out in public. She said, 12 long years, I couldn't go to the temple. 12 long years, I've been unclean. But I heard Jesus is coming to town. I've spent all my money on the doctors. I've spent all my money on the medicine. I've spent myself ragged and worn out. And I'm just hoping that I'll die. But I heard about Jesus of Nazareth. He's making his way through town. And if I can but touch the hill of his garment, I think everything But if you can just touch the hem of his garment, he's not in 
miracle right now. Thousands of people were pulling at Jesus, tugging at his clothes. And Jesus stopped everything. And he said, hold on. Somebody touched me. The disciples thought Jesus had freaked. They said, what do you mean somebody touched you? The sun is getting to him, boys. Jesus said, no, I'm not talking about them. I've been feeling them for minutes now. But somebody just touched me in a supernatural way. How do you know? Because virtue left my body. I didn't even tell it to go. And I'm omniscient. I know what to do. I know when to say, go heal her. But she touched me with such a need. She touched me with such a hunger. And with such a desire. That virtue left my body. I don't know about you, but I've been there before. I didn't even know what to pray for like I should. And all of a sudden, God came down and answered my prayer. And made a way out of no way. He opened doors I couldn't see. You have a need? I have a God. You have a need? I have a God. You have a need? I have a God. Jesus said unto them, depart not. Give them something to eat. You don't understand, Jesus says 25,000 of them. All we have is two fish and five loaves. We didn't plan on bringing food today. You've been preaching out here for hours and long-winded preachers. We didn't plan on eating lunch out here today, dinner on the ground. And we're going to send them away. Jesus said, what are you doing sending them away? What do you mean sending the people away? Give me what you have. Two fish and five loaves. It's not much, but bring it to me. Hey man, I hear people thinking they're doing me favors about getting rid of people in the church that's got problems. Man, what in the world is the matter with you? He that is whole have no need of position. I, I can't even preach to somebody that doesn't need anything. Some of you got your act together. Hey man, this message is not for you all the time, but it's for people that don't know what they're going to do. It's for people that everybody else has given up on. Pastor, we ran them off for you. They got too many troubles. We don't want them in our church. What you need to remember is where you were when God found you. And remember how ready for hellfire you were. I thank God for a church. This is not a hospice. This is a hospital. A hospice is where you go to feel good while you're dying. But a hospital is where you go to get surgery to fix what's the matter with you. This is why I'm in the house of God today. Because I have a need, but I have a God. Send them away. You have a need, but this is a desert place. You have a need, I have a God. Two fish and five loaves, and Jesus began to break it. And Jesus won't break what he doesn't plan on blessing. And he doesn't bless what he doesn't intend on multiplying. God has said, why y'all been going through so much trouble, Brother Christopher Jones? Hey Amen. Why is God breaking you? The reason God is breaking us and breaking the church and breaking us in trouble after trouble after trouble, restraining orders and injunctions and, and surveillance and, and illegal phone taps and bad judgments and crooked politicians and, and crooked law enforcement and illegal activities. Why is the Lord allowing you to be broken? It's very simple. According to, to Matthew 14 and 16. The Lord lets you be broken so he can multiply you. And the reason he multiplies you is so he can bless you and send you forth to the people. And when you come out of your impossible situation that the devil thought he would destroy you, you get out there in your job and in your family reunion and in your neighborhood and say, let me tell you what the Lord has done. He made a way Shalom. He's Jehovah Rapha. He's Jehovah Nisi. He's Jehovah Sin. 
the weapon is! 